Hello and welcome back, everyone. We had the final of finals, the grand finale, and Oscar, you have the floor. Campeones, campeones, ole, ole, ole. Uh, um, you guys can imagine how I feel right now. Yeah. Um, like the result of everything seen, Argentina and Messi and Scaloni, everyone happy. The whole game itself, you know, that well, I'm sure all of us have been through various sorts of emotions today. <laughs> yeah, we, we've been through it. And let's walk through the final because, like, as we were talking off air, both of you guys were saying how this was one of the greatest, supposed to be the greatest game of football, the greatest World Cup final. But I, I have a different opinion based on the start because, like, I was watching this at a bar and after Argentina started so well, it, it appeared to be a drab World Cup final. Yeah, like, France really played a part in making everything really interesting because up until the 80th minute, they were absolutely terrible. Like, for for whatever reason, they just did not show up at all. It was so bad that Deschamps had to make drastic changes in the first half, you know, taking off Giroud and Dembele in before 40 minutes is not something anyone had on their minds, no matter how bad the situation would be. But, yeah... I kind of agree with you. The thing is that goals change games at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, and goals certainly did change the games. And Makai, what was your opinion on the final as a whole in terms of the game? Do you think it's up there with the best World Cup final in history? The, one of the best games in history? Um, For World Cup finals, it's probably the best I've seen. But with your point, um, where up until that first penalty, it was pretty one-sided. Um, however, after that, I mean, I can't think of many more games that have just, <laughs> uh, let's just say like, it's a good thing, like a cardiologist essentially <laughs> <laughs> in Argentina, for example. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I, I found the second, I guess if you were to break it up into parts, the second part was really, really entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, it was really entertaining, and I love the way the players played this game. And it was it was super intense because, and this is the type of game that football really needs. And this final was really the Messi and Mbappe show, as you can see on your screen. Like those were the two standout players. It was the king versus the heir. It was it, it had everything. It's like Messi came up top in the first couple of minutes, but Mbappe was like, "Yeah, I'm here for it." And let's start with the first part of the of this game from Argentina. And that was the penalty. What do you think about this penalty? Argentina, they've gotten tons of controversial penalties over this World Cup, but do you guys think this was a penalty? Depends on the angle. There are some... On first look, I thought it definitely was a penalty. On a couple of angles, I'm struggling to see where Dembele actually touched him. Yeah. I mean, it's not a dive, but then I don't really see the point of contact either. So. Yeah. I guess there's an opinion to be made that, okay, he does get clipped. But when I saw that at first, I was like, he does get clipped, but this is a contact sport, right? Mm-hmm. That's like, and that, those sort of things can happen in the box. But with that being said, they, they do give the penalty. Makai, what do you think about that? Um, I thought it was a penalty. Perhaps like one of those just, you know, little clips that makes a player unbalanced essentially i didn't i haven't seen like a um i hadn't i didn't even know that was much of a controversy i guess until you just mentioned it but yeah i mean i'll watch it back again but i didn't see any issue with the call initially yeah and there was no issues and at that point argentina goes one nil up and things are going smooth smoothly and everyone is thinking okay yes they finally have a chance can they do it and then de maria appears he makes it to zero, and wow. Like, how good were Argentina playing at this point, Mikhail? Oh, they were excellent. I, I don't know. We'll probably talk about how France as well were, but um, yeah, they were brilliant. One thing that I felt the best player on the field, at least in the first half, was Angel Di Maria, who just, I guess everyone thought he'd be playing on the right-hand side, yeah, trying to take on Teo Hernandez but it turned out to be the other flank which I think just I don't for whatever reason that he was just causing Conde and Dembele a lot of problems 
Yeah, he was. And I, I felt that was a mistake, Oscar. And because the reason why was because Dembele going up against Kunde, who's smart defend, defensively, he's one of the best defenders in La Liga. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, there's Kunde is going to, I'm sorry, not Dembele, De Maria. Kunde is going to eat De Maria at this point. But De Maria sure proved to be stubborn, as Mikhail said. He yeah. caused the penalty, then he scored again. Yeah, De Maria caused all sorts of problems on that side, just staying wide and creating havoc. And yeah, it was a good return from him into the team, you know. Um, I I do have to disagree with Mikali a little bit. I thought McAllister was actually Argentina's best player in the first half. As good as Di Maria was, I thought McAllister really, really stepped up in this game until chaos on his seat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. But Mikali, would you have a response for that? Um... No, because I think Oscar will explain the reason as to what he did as well defensively, which yeah. is something that, you know, this was by far Griezmann's, like, quietest game. Like, by yeah. far, he was completely invisible. Exactly. And, I mean, it's that that midfield pair, they're at least the ones that played centrally. I mean, you can also include DePaul in this because he's really good off the right. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, those, that, those two midfields, uh, center midfielders both of them didn't start that first game right so they were brought into the team essentially to like yeah. grow as the group stage progress mm-hmm. they've been excellent but yeah McAllister was brilliant as well yeah he really did a good job in keeping Griezmann quiet as well like you said yeah he really did a good job and and after those two goals it looked like it was set for an Argentina victory we're going to get onto the controversy later on but guys why was France so bad in the first 80 minutes? I think it took them until 70 minutes to get their first shot of targets. They didn't show up for this final at all up until this up until when they scored. Yeah. I feel it's a combination of many things. Like they've had the disruptions of the um, flu. I think it's flu, right? They, they, yeah. the, the virus, yeah. So uh, Rabio, Upamecano, Varane, Konate, they all, they've all had it. So I feel like that would have affected those individual performances. Yeah. I also feel like we have to give Argentina a lot of credit for France being that bad because Scaloni really looked at... Because Scaloni, we've just talked about how he looks at different opponents and yeah. does different things. So the Di Maria team, for instance, and then making sure they had Griezmann quiet and monitored making sure that DePaul was able to back up Molina when he came to Mbappe, all these little things. And then the fact that Argentina essentially created overloads in midfield meant that France could not get any part of the ball at all until Argentina decided to sit back and everything. So I feel it comes down to just the sloppy mistakes we've seen from France throughout the tournament, the you know off-the-field issues, and then Argentina just outsmarting them tactically. Yeah, and I, I would like to give praise to Scaloni, as you said, because he's been the manager that he's proven himself to be tactically astute to draw this tournament. He's proven himself to be flexible. And the one thing that I liked about Argentina is that they did dominate in midfield, where I didn't think they had that much quality, severe quality compared to France. And another thing they did very well is to protect their wing backs up until you know who showed up. Because yeah. up until that point, mm-hmm. it's like, there were there were not many one on ones against Molina or against Tagafico who came in for um for Acuna. And you didn't really see Dembele or Mbappe get that much joy for the first seventy odd minutes of the game. Right, Mikhail? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was I thought it was I mean, we saw after the second goal went in that Mbappe essentially moved into a central position. I think that was just testament to how well Argentina were at just closing passing lanes, just, you know, limiting his touches. I think he had like 11 touches or something just in the first yeah. half, which is a very, very small number. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Rodrigo de Paul, I thought was brilliant. Um, what I, I still can't really work out specifically what happened, but the relationship he had with, um, uh, uh, Molina, just the communication and stuff you could see on the first like initial minutes was just really interesting as to how yeah. they were kind of sussing out spaces and stuff. It's almost like they play in the same club, right, Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, they play in the same club. <laughs> Not the exact same way, though, but the understanding is different. <laughs> yeah. Actually, come to think of it, both of them were Udinese, right? Yeah. Udinese. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that connection is it should be like the back of their hand by now. But yeah, yeah, yeah. two of them did a really good job. Yeah, they do. Like, Diego Simeone must be scratching his head until why. Why? Why exactly. did it play so well? But as, as we've mentioned, everything was going so well for Argentina. I was already saying this is going to be a very quick finish for them. And then, what was Otamendi thinking for that penalty? You know, ever since he left England, Otamendi has actually become better as a defender because he doesn't make those brain dead mistakes anymore but today you know they just had to come back because <laughs> yeah like it was just weird how he just decided to make that foul there and depending on how um i forgot if it was Colomani or Turam, depending on where they were running to that could have been a red card so yeah very very careless of him yeah i i, I watched it last time i thought maybe that could have been a red card i thought but you know what? Um, he got lucky. Mm-hmm. It was a, just a penalty. Mbappe, he gets his chance. And you, I feel sorry for Emmy because Emmy gets a touch on there. And, yeah. But Mbappe scores. And then chaos erupts because 95 seconds later. In the back of the net again. again. <laughs> it's <With> a beautiful <laughs> volley that, as much as I wanted to admire it, it just made my heart sink. I was like, God, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the way he takes it, the way it, it, it was, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah. Emmy gets a hand on this too. Yeah. <laughs> he actually got a hand on all of Mbappe's goals. Actually, he got a hand on the penalty, the, the penalty and shit, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. He got a hand on that. And Mikhail, at this point, Everyone and their mother thought Argentina was going to collapse. This was it. This was the great collapse that happened. Then, they boy did they need extra time. Yeah, they definitely did extra time. <laughs> yeah, France just had all the momentum after that. Uh, I guess half, what first goal, second goal, whatever you want to put it, with ninety uh, something seconds between the two. Yeah, they. I mean, yeah, France were. It, I mean, it took a while for Deschamps' changes, I guess, to kind of work out. But just having that sort of direct pace in three different areas of the field really, really yeah. uh, gave the center backs and full backs a lot of issues. Yeah, and, and a strength change you made was that turned out to work was bringing in Kamavinga and playing him as left back. And also Kingsley Coleman came in and... That's sort of what led to the, that's the genesis of this goal. It's Coleman winning the ball off Messi and making that mm-hmm. cross, and that's how France were able to score. Yeah, and, I've seen we've seen for Real Madrid, Camavinga is a super sub. <laughs> yeah, he brought a lot of energy on that left side. It was a risk, but at this point, no God, no glory, right? So yeah, no. And after after this. Argentina with Messi still has that one chance, that one shot that could have been the crown and glory. But Hugo Uris comes up big, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, it was a great shot that was like dipping, but then it was a bit central, and you'd expect Lloris to save it given how he has dealt with long shots throughout the tournament. Yeah, he, he did that very well. But when it came to extra time, Messi appeared again. Yeah. You know, lots of people have been angry that he's been getting penalties, but he can score open play goals too. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is, like, people always compare, they'll, they'll always do that comparison between Messi and Maradona. And it's one thing is, Maradona never scored in the World Cup final. Yeah. I'd have two World Cup finals. So, mm-hmm. and at that point, I felt, I felt Argentina, although they, you could tell they were struggling a bit, you could tell maybe the momentum had changed to France. They got a lot of really good chances to score the third. So I was a bit worried about them. I was like, because Latara had that two chances to score. One where he delayed a bit. The other one where I don't think he connects it well. Yeah. And then Messi scored. And how much of a pressure was that lift off from Argentina from Argentina's perspective? Yeah, it was huge because like we were saying, going to extra time, they were the ones that needed extra time. And yeah. 
when that goal went in, you kind of thought, okay, we'll have the first knockout game in this World Cup. Finally, decide in extra time, but <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> and Mikhail, I'll talk about Lautaro for a moment because this is a guy who's obviously suffering from a crisis of confidence. Like when he came on, I wish he scored the winner, just so just because it would be a nice story. But he had two chances before this to really kill the game, and he he didn't really do that. Yeah, I mean the header in particular is a golden opportunity. Yeah, I mean yeah, that's one I like. You, I mean, you'd all expect him to at least hit the target from there off of a relatively free header. Um, but, I mean, if you're to ask him back now whether it's miss the chance or, you know, end up a world champion, I think he'll, he'll, he'd choose the latter. Yeah, he definitely will choose the latter. And we all thought, like uh, like Oscar was saying, we all thought it was going to be done in extra time. But what was Montiel thinking for that penalty, Oscar? I have to say, Montiel was not thinking in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we have this inside joke of how Sevilla athletic players have had mixed World Cup performances, you know, carrying their club form into it. Yeah, that was Sevilla Montiel right there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, God. Well, yeah. I was like, again, like, go, I'm like, some forces don't want this messy final to happen. No. <laughs> yeah. No. And Mikhail, no, no question from Mbappe. That was another brilliant. Like to do, like like he is becoming, based on this performance, one of the most clutch players in world football at the moment. Yeah, the steel, the, you know, just the sure amount of just pure steel you need to, you know, hit one penalty, uh, to the keeper's right, and then the second penalty to the keeper's right is. Ah, uh, man, that takes a lot of lot of courage to do that. Both of them, obviously, very good penalties as well. But, I mean, yeah, that's as clutch as you can get. Yeah, and, and then we talk about him, right, about how good it is. And I'm sure people would say, oh, but it's just a penalty. But the psychology of taking two penalties against the same goalkeeper, three, in fact, we'll get, we'll get into that. But you think of what happened with Harry Kane mm-hmm. and in that second penalty where... The pressure got to him, but Mbappe just showed that like calm nerves to really do it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a skill in itself to kind of just deflect stress, anxiety, essentially when when you're on the spot for a penalty. Particularly, we're not even, you know, we're not even considering the fact this is a World Cup final. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's a yeah. It takes a lot of gahunes essentially to be able to to hit the spot from there. Yeah, it really in such circumstances. Well. Yeah, and that made him become the World Cup's top goal scorer. And then from then, it was all up to penalties. And in penalties, Argentina have an ace off their sleeve, and that's Andy Martinez. And how <laughs> he is undescribable, man. He is he's such a joy to watch because of all his flamboyance, all his antics and everything. Mm-hmm. But from the moment he went to penalties, I, I had a feeling Argentina had won it because of him. Yeah, you know, he's he's been often the difference making penalty shooters for Argentina over the last year and a few months. And he did it again, you know, semantics, you know, tossing <laughs> the ball away, getting into people's heads, you know, the little things. Yeah, the little things. Dancing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Mbappe did get him the third time, though. <laughs> yeah, like, it didn't, that didn't work on Mbappe. And again, he guessed right. Had a hand on it, but you know, Mbappe was just on a different level today. He was on demon time, as the kids would say. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was not joking today. Yeah, was it a, was it a, an issue of Argentina of any being so good, or was it that the French penalties were bad before Mbappe? I'll say for Tramini's penalties, a bit of boot for Coman. And Coman's penalty wasn't really good because it's an area where if the goalkeeper gets it right, he's saving it. So, yeah. so I mean, he definitely, that was the typical example of mind games and how <laughs> they can mess up with you. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure because I, I don't really see Germany as a penalty taker. So that's that's somewhat surprising. Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking who else could have taken a penalty before him? There's... 
I know they brought the Sassy on for penalties. Konate is good at penalties from what I know. Uh, yeah. A lot of the usual penalty takers were subbed off. Yeah. Yeah. Mikhail, any thoughts? Um, I'm just going to backtrack one sec on Martinez because he, ju- he did make a ridiculous save. Um, right, I think... Like right at the end. Oh, minutes, yeah. 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 I, I forgot about that too. Like that's no, no, it's fine. It's just one of those where it's like obviously like what he did in the penalty shootouts is incredible. But he, he made one say that like again, it's just fine margins at the end of the day. Yeah. That yeah. I just thought like yeah. I don't know. I just saw the opportunity essentially come yeah. to yeah, Munai and then yeah. just Save like just... Rob, like Robin against Casillas, the oh, fine, yeah, fine margins. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. one of those very so, fine margins. And yeah. do you know, do you know what I loved about that save? Like it was so, it made it at the right time because the bounce of the ball from that save normally goes to a French attacker, and that's still a goal. But the bounce of the ball takes it away from the French attacker. So, and that's just magical. Yeah. It's like one of those moments where, like, that's the thing with football. As much as we're happy now, it's mar- it's a very marginal game, a very unfair game sometimes. And if Colomani does anything different, you know, we're having a completely different conversation <laughs> right now. But yeah. hey, I guess we'll never know. Yeah, I guess we'll never know. Maybe Lumi will be on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lumi did not need to catch that stray right now. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Lumi. But, like, football does give second chances, and it did give a second chance to Montiel, who had his Fabio Grosso moments, taking the final penalty after he made that mistake. And I, I was really happy about it, the fact that he got to take the final one. I was scared for him a bit. I thought he was going to sky it over, but uh, he's not got it. <laughs> he took a good one against Croatia, but my only concern with him was that, as a defender, usually defenders only go one way, and I was thinking... Loris has probably seen the Croatia game. I would go that way. And Loris did go that way, but Montiel had the you know calmness of mind to go another way and seal the deal. To the day, and that led to Argentina finally winning the World Cup with Lionel Messi. What do you think of He's... the Arab, what do you think of the Arab, Arab shirt? First of yeah. all? <laughs> they had they had to drift him up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it was the way of honoring him for you know what Messi has done, not just for Argentina but for the game of football in general. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if they would have done that with uh, Yuris. That would have been a very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. My my brother was saying they'd never do this with Ronaldo. <laughs> he even went as far as saying they won't shoot the fireworks and like, come on, that's just being ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's Lucille Stadium. They're going to use those fireworks or something. Yeah. I, I, have Argentina been the best team in this tournament? I, that's the thing. Best team is subjective because you could say teams like Brazil were the best team because of the football they played. Not that Argentina haven't played some great stuff, but I'm saying like best is subjective. At the end of the day, the best team doesn't always win. Like, the best team on paper doesn't always win a tournament, so... Yeah. yeah. It's certainly grown throughout the competition, which yeah. I think is impressive. A lot to do, obviously, with Scaloni, as we've talked about, and knockout round, particularly. Um, I mean, France has been a good shout as well. Brazil has also been a good shout, but been pretty consistent for the most part. Yeah. yeah, it's just France, that first half today... Uh, man, it was just—I don't know—they yeah, just seemed very lethargic. Hmm. Yeah, I was also—I uh, was, also, was going to say something. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> it will come to me. Yeah, I think you were talking about England. No, not England. No, no. Why would I mention England? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't no, know. No, okay, I was going to say. <laughs> It will come to me. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah. So another thing I want to say, you're right, Mikhail, in that Argentina, in terms of growth, like I, remember uh, that's I found how it. The, that Saudi Arabia game, mm-hmm. how they grew. Like after that game, it was all chaos, and everyone was thinking, okay, this Argentina team is not it, including myself. I never really yeah. Had plans for this. Yeah, I mean, we talked off the air where we essentially thought that they, there's no chance they could beat like a Brazil, essentially. And that was yeah. like what the you said that after like the round of sixteen, I think. 
Yeah. And the thing, though, is that they never faced the Brazil. So there's that, there's <laughs> yeah, that that's element the, of it. The irony. Yeah. There's that element. But, yeah. but what I'll say about them is that they have grown. Like the game against, I feel the game against Poland was a big turning point because after that game, every single game they played, they really dominated. They've really been the best, the better team. Even in this game against France, for most of the game, Argentina were the better team, but France, they came back with a vengeance. Yeah. And another little nugget that I, I would like to put here is that you guys remember in the last World Cup where Argentina went, uh, first of all, they were in the same group with Croatia, who knocked the second out to them. In the last 16, they get France. And France knocks them out as well. And it's somewhere like they got that element of revenge here because in Cro- against Croatia in the semifinals, they outplayed Croatia and they took them off the field. And here in the World Cup final, they're beating France. Revenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's sweet, eh? <laughs> I'm just glad none of the players said about going for revenge before the game like Salah did. That, that never ends well. Yeah, never ends but yeah. Well. What I was going to say was that essentially because of the Saudi Arabia game and loss, they had to treat every game as a final because if they lost to Mexico, they'd have been out. If they lost to Poland, they'd have been out. So every game was essentially a final for them, which is something our friend, the friend of this pod, Zizi, would be proud of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And who were the unsung heroes of this Argentina team? Apart from, Because Messi will obviously get the spotlight. I'm going to say... Alexis McAllister was is one of the unsung heroes because he was absolutely phenomenal. He stepped into that Los Celso sized hole in this team really well. At first, they tried to fill that with Papu Gomez, but that didn't work. And McAllister really took his opportunity well. I feel like he's the main unsung hero. Obviously, the likes of Alvarez and Enzo will get their plaudits, and Di Maria, so and Martinez, so. I feel McAllister is one that people might overlook. I think years from now, with hindsight, we might be considering that like that sort of midfield partnership, essentially, of uh, or at least players that weren't necessary, you know, that just got their debuts this year, last year, in the case of McAllister, uh, were are just excellent players, but you know. Prior to this tournament, they and the Enzo Fernandez's of the world and the um, Lexus McAllisters of the world, essentially, I did not see them playing this big of a part. Yeah. They've been just answering all questions in flying colors, essentially, you know, tackles, the tackles they make, the presses they make, winning the first ball, second ball. And, you know, their biggest virtue, at least in Enzo's, is like his distribution of the ball. Yeah. Like, that's. I don't know. It's like a mold of essentially like a Modric or Cruz with him. Yeah. And then McAllister's like ability to kind of just float in spaces that we thought was just going to be an issue with the Lo Celso injury essentially heading into the tournament. Yeah, and I remember Enzo's pass for um, Alvarez in that Poland game, and that was beautiful. And his goal against Mexico. Yeah, it was excellent. Yeah, for myself, I'll, I'll go with the coach because um, a guy like Scaloni is not a uh, typical coach that rolls around the tongue. And he's a guy, like we've discussed on this pod, he's shown his willingness to be, to be adaptable, to be flexible. And he's shown some tactical astuteness that we didn't see under San Paoli or under Sadea in the last two campaigns for Argentina. Mm-hmm. And another guy that I'd like to um, highlight here is uh, Chuti Romero because in the first game against Saudi Arabia, he was terrible. Like, he was a fault for two of the goals, in my opinion. And a lot of things that we don't, um, a quality that we don't really give much value in life is resilience, the ability to come back from several blows. And I felt he really did that. I felt he came back stronger. He gave stronger performances and he grew throughout the game. And I feel that's worth a shout. Yeah, I'd agree with you. The coach is obviously going to be very underrated because, you know, he's going to be lost in the whole messy team. Even Montiel <laughs> will be. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to actually watch the game to remember Montiel scored yeah. the winning penalty at this point. Yeah, it's not going to be like Fabio Carso, who's like every, like, when you think of the Italy World Cup, you think of Fabio Carso because he got the winning penalty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
And what about for France? Where do they go from here? Because it's a not it's it's is this a su- success for them? Michael, you want to take this? Hmm. I mean, so one sort of just on a side note, I guess is this is a game that like Benzema would have been very useful in essentially. Yeah. Where it's you know just the the on field switch rather than Giroud, who just lacks mobility, where Benzema can kind of just shift into like a wider role, would have been very useful. But I ultimately their injuries, I think like Conte Pogba. Are just just stalwarts essentially. I know Trumani is just brilliant as well, but when you just consider like Deschamps had like six, possibly six starters that all unfortunately fell from injury prior to the game uh, or prior to the tournament is a little bit um, unfortunate. But ultimately, I mean they they do have a very young team still. So and like. A surplus of just defensive talent, essentially. So I think looking forward, they should be fine. I mean, killing Mbappe. Let's not forget he is only twenty three years old. Yeah, like that guy is going to win tournaments after tournaments after tournaments in his future. Uh, Oscar, like, do you, you think France will be okay as well? Yeah, France will be fine. You know, it's just the fact that we've seen champions. You know fall and um, fall at the group stage and they didn't do that and they got all the way and just lost on penalties is a credit to them and they'll be back yeah they'll be back and especially what, what, what Mikhail said the absences they have the fact that like Benzema got injured and he couldn't um partake mm-hmm. in the rest of the tournaments we were missing Pogba obviously it's it's Luca Hernandez it's so many injuries like they yeah, Kempembe and Nkunku as well yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Really... it's crazy um, so, we're done with that. Who do you guys think? Do you guys agree with the award that was given for Messi as the best player of the tournament? Yeah. Yeah. No, no complaints about that, right? No, no complaints about any of the awards. <laughs> yeah. I'd have possibly, I don't know, if Morocco got at least third, I'd have given Bono best goalie, but Ibu has made some absolutely great saves at penalty shootouts and then that last save during normal time. So, yeah, I guess it's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's fair. And with Mbappe, you won the Golden Boot, obviously. So, guys, who's who do you guys put as your best, your team of the tournament? Yeah, I'm going to have to change that. Let me see. <laughs> let, let me... Oof. Uh, okay, so I'm going to say I'll still stick with Bono. Bono? Yeah. Yeah. Um, right back, Hakimi. Center back, Vardiol and Romero. Okay. Left back, I'll stick with you. Midfield, Enzo. Um, Griezmann. I kind of want to put McAllister in for Modric. Well, let's leave. Mo- let's let's say Brozovic. Yeah, Brozovic. And um, up top, Messi, Mbappe, and Alvarez. Okay. Nice, nice. I think you made some changes there because um, yeah, I changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think last time we spoke about this, you had Saiz there. Uh, I drew in to add them. Um, I think those are the main two changes I made. Yeah, was uh, Mikhail? Um, mine is Bono. I thought he was the best keeper, perhaps. Her, just, I mean, there's some good shots, actually. Um, I went the cross the back line with Hakimi, Varan, Bardiol, and Hernandez. I went with a midfield four because I just thought some of these four just affected their team just so much. Um, I went with uh, Brozovic as like your defensive midfield, and then just in front of him, uh, Anahi, Griezmann, and Enzo Fernandez. And then up top, I went with the two of Messi and Mbappe. That's nice. Yeah, no, no love for Amrabat, guys. Yeah, he was. I was fighting between Amrabat and then the other four midfielders. So that is, com- yeah, I'm completely fine putting Amrabat in for any of 
Yeah. Any of them that isn't Griezmann. I think Griezmann's clearly been yeah. the third, pro- well, not the first, perhaps the second or third best of the tournament. Yeah, that is very true. Um, my team is a lot similar to Oscar's team, actually. Um, the I guess the goalkeeper will stay the same, it will be Bono. Um, the back four will be the same as his. The midfield three, instead of um, Brozovic, I'm going to bring in, it's going to be Amarbat, Griezmann, and um, Enzo for me, because I feel Amarbat in those games against Spain and Portugal, he was such an important player. And that defensive skill he had. Uh, the front three, it's Messi and Mbappe. And I, I at first I was going to go for Giroud, but actually thinking about this before the podcast and the knockout stages, Alvarez has really shown, and that's why I think he's at a better tournament than Giroud. Yeah, that's fair. He, he, Alvarez really did step up in knockout rounds. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, any final words for the end of this amazing? Yeah, game? I just had a, I had a question for you guys. Essentially, with the whole messy legacy element of this, oh, yeah. like, what what do you make? <laughs> that very just broad, overly done sort of topic. Yeah, yeah. Oscar, do you want to go first? Or... Yeah, I mean, I've always said this game won't change my opinion either way, but it was nice to complete football. <laughs> yeah, you know what? This is actually a game that I'm fired up, I'm fired I'm up about. So. Right? Because well, it's a question I was fired, I'm fired up about because of what it means for the game because of what it means for football and Messi he's had such a converting career when it was at Barcelona and he's always done okay for the international team right he's done he's got taken to finals I just felt it was past the unfair the fact that it was judged as a failure for reaching a final given how hard it is and I really do feel like he deserves this for what he's done in football for the last 16 17 years it's amazing. Ronaldo is a great player, but I have always felt Messi was better. And I, but, and it, I thought it was a shame that you needed people needed a World Cup to show that he was the best player of the generation. When he's won so many Champions Leagues, he's competed in the same league as Ronaldo and always done better. So, but he, here it is. <laughs> but I'm I'm super happy for him because this is a tournament that always eluded him, and now he finally has won it. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, it definitely just ends some of the, like, daft comments of, like, <laughs> oh, if this player doesn't, like, win this tournament in a collective team game, it's like they're somehow, you know, diminished when it comes to comparing themselves with some of the other players throughout the history of the game. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Again, comparing people across history where like rules have changed, like the speed of play, the amount of tackles, like how hard tackles are, is just is like, it's almost an impossible task. Uh, it's almost impossible. And the thing that, and I think we discussed this, like Diego Maradona didn't score in any World Cup final, but he did give a great assist, right? So it's football is a team sport and you're reliant on other members of your team. Like for example, Messi might not have won this World Cup without Emiliano Martinez, who made a brilliant save at the dying moments of the game to take them to extra time and to penalties. And Martinez was amazing in penalties against Holland. It was amazing in penalties um, today as well. And we also have to look at Alvarez and everything. But at the end of the day, he's a player who's always shown magic throughout his career, throughout his 16, 17-year career. And that's why I'm really happy for him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy as well. Like, I, th- I guess for the, from him for what he's given the sport, I think it's, it's just definitely very pleasant to see. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with that said, we at La Cancha say goodbye to one of the most brilliant World Cups in history. Qatar 2022 will be known for many things: controversial, the lack of respect for human rights. But with all that in the background, we've seen an amazing football tournament where Leo Messi finally wins the World Cup. And with that, Asala Kancha says goodbye and see you next time. Adios.